Welcome to the 11 o'clock service. Appreciate those who were at the 10 o'clock service as well. We have a few more coming back. Hopefully, <laughs> we're good, right? <laughs> That's what we're hoping for. You just never know with this stuff, right? All right. We have, I uh, want to welcome those who are any visitors we have. We have on our bulletin a visitor's card, if you would fill that in. I don't see anybody that hasn't been here before. Uh, also, uh, give you a few updates. Uh, we were at the Readathon last night, held in a nondescript, unclosed building downtown. <laughs> it actually wasn't on the capsule steps, but we were in an office building, real small townhouse, which I'm sure has a real big rent. It's right behind the Supreme Court. So, And some were live streaming. I saw my wife on the live stream, and uh, Anita and uh, Laura, and so uh, we so we were doing that. Hopefully by May they'll be able to get back to the steps. Uh, please check the eligible voting list. We already had some mistakes uh, noted. Uh, we are planning on having our annual business meeting uh, be the uh, second Tuesday of November, week after the election. Uh, national election. You did know this election going on, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I heard that, right? Um, and so, uh, also, we're still continuing on with Facebook uh, and um, YouTube and uh, WebEx. Uh, at ten o'clock service, which used to be the evening service, I'm looking at morphing that into once we get more people in. To doing the evening service and then doing a Sunday school thing right after based upon the evening service. So we get some back to the little Sunday school type of thing. So we'll see. 11 o'clock service, of course, uh, we're streaming it also. We're trying to get the audio correct. <laughs> and uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge. YouTube, I think, is coming up pretty good right now. So that's good. Now, I've been asked about the Wednesday night service. Uh, Wednesday night service, we're still doing on WebEx. If you'd like to join us on Wednesday night, you know, just let me know. We'll send you an invitation. That's been working fairly well, I think. When the children are back on Wednesday nights, we'll also come back here for um, our Bible study and our prayer time. But John, can we still do WebEx from back there? Okay, so we can do that still for people still not comfortable coming back. So we'll try, you know, to do the whole thing. Okay, um, but we are on, on WebEx at seven o'clock on Wednesday nights. Uh, ladies are having a time of fellowship with prayer and devotion on Thursday nights from seven fifteen to eight thirty. With uh, Jennifer Swan, contact her to get an email link if you want to join them. The Billy Graham Evangelist Association will be having a prayer march on Saturday, September the 26th, 12 um, to noon till 2. They're going to start with Franklin Graham giving a message down at the Lincoln Memorial. They're going to march to the Capitol. Now, I'm not sure about the safety issues as far as a large Christian event down there. So that's so at the prayer. We have a whole bunch of information on it, but it's still in a box in the office. I don't know if Lee's back there or not. Uh, or John, you go in the office and open up the uh, box there, which has the Billy Graham stuff in it, and put it out on the table, if you would. You know, So you'll just see it. So that's the information about the prayer march and just be in prayer for them. Uh, we will have our... Mission Emphasis Weekend, it'll be scaled down, but Jerry and Susan Pfaff will be with us. Uh, we'll have the men's breakfast, and this is very important, uh, both the men who are here and the men who are maybe listening online, if to any, but uh, sign up if you're planning on coming to that. It's different this year, right? Normally, um, we'd get 20 men. But sign up if you're coming to the breakfast on October the 3rd at 8 o'clock uh, for our missions. Uh, time with Jerry Pfaff, of course, is in Papua New Guinea. They're 
uh, finished publishing one half of the New Testament, and you can see the book out there. We plan on taking that book and putting it on the book table for the uh, National Readathon. It's the first time that language has been put down in the scriptures. So it'll be the first time we've, we've had a copy of that. And so uh, take a look at that. And uh, ladies are going to have a fellowship time, I think. Do you know what time that's going to be? Okay, 2 o'clock down at Teresa's place, right? Okay, so uh, there should be a sign-up sheet on the back table for that as well. Uh, and so then, then Jerry will be given a message uh, and an update on uh, Sunday morning. So I'm assuming he's going to do a Sunday school type thing at 10, and then we'll do the regular time at 11, something like that. Um, so sign up. If you're going to come to the breakfast and sign up if you're going to come to the ladies' uh, function down yeah, Teresa. Uh, our update for missions is uh, from the Van Warts, who, who are where? Uganda. Uganda, okay. Um, they said it's the rainy season now in Uganda, which actually means it, they got some cooler temperatures. Uh, it's muggy all the time, but now the rainy season drops the temperature some, and so she said, I feel more like baking now than I did before. Uh, Matt has instructed in basic health training at the Bible College, has met with uh, the principal of the college to make future plans, and, and took care of and ministered to a terminally ill woman, you know, in the neighborhood. Uh, Matt is still adjusting being team leader. The children are persevering through school. Alex has just turned six and uh, on August the 11th, and Nathaniel will turn 15 on September the 30th. Uh, they drove to Kampala for the children's passports, and the children attended a day camp, camp during the week at their team mates uh, compound. They hosted a family of seven from the hills of uh, Kessaro twice who were in town for dental work. So they had <clears throat> opportunity to minister to that family. They have hosted various socially, social distancing meals with several families. <clears throat> they have helped several families pack and lead a mission field <clears throat> for various reasons, furlough or going off the field, and so that's actually been a pretty sad time for them to send them back. Now listen to this. They are praying that the airport would open up because they have not received mail since March, nor could they send any mail back to the states since March. They haven't received any packages, nothing. He said, we're really praying that we can get the mail service back so we can you know, send and receive, uh, receive mail. So, uh, so just be in prayer for the uh, uh, Van Warts uh, in uh, Uganda. And uh, we'll include that. Todd, you'll include uh, them in your prayer time. All right. Good morning, everyone. All right. I'm going to be reading today from Romans chapter 8, 18, 18 through 30. And... Before I get started, what I wanted to bring up was the um, Deacon's Fund. As you know, one of the programs that we have is the Deacon's Fund. We use that as a, um, you know, to help out folks in the church and church members and families and, um, you know, who are in need. And so far, you know, you guys have been great um, at uh, helping to uh, donate to Missions Fund. I know Pastor brings it up uh, when we have uh, communion every, every month, but um, it's open any time um, if you feel you want to uh, donate. Uh, we've helped some folks who need it in the church family. Um, and I also want to bring it up that it is available. You know, if, if um, you know, the, the first place you should go uh, for help when you're in need is to your family and that includes your church family. So please, if you do have a need, please uh, feel free to t uh, talk to one of us and, and, and the, uh, one of the deacons and we'll see what we can do to help you. So, and again, thank you very much for uh, supporting that program. All right, from Romans here, uh, chapter 8, starting in verse 18. 
For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because of the creation itself, it, excuse me, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he, he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, the, he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, um, we've been fortunate in this country in that uh, we've been able to, to pray and to read your word and to do so uh, at, at basically any time, Lord, without fear of persecution or fear of imprisonment. But we know, Lord, that this uh, is not true across the world. We also see, Lord, some of the uh, things that are going on in this country as men grow wax, wax worse and worse. And Lord, we could see a time in the near future where we, we may have to suffer persecution. But Lord, we know that it's not in vain. And it is, is, Lord, it's for your glory. And Lord, that we see the hope, Lord, and we see it in the good times, we see it in the bad. Lord, we see that... Um, uh, in this pandemic, Lord, we see the, the hope that people have to still come to church or to, to attend even online, to read your word in public. And Lord, we, we pray, Lord, that we be a light. We know we've heard from other missionaries that they look at us as a light, as a beacon of hope in their home countries. Lord, we pray that you would uh, help to maintain that light here in this country. Lord, we pray for our missionaries out in the field who, Lord, during this time may not have the conveniences or comforts, uh, even during normal times, but especially now during this pandemic. We pray for the Van Warts, Lord, that they could, uh, perhaps they could get their, their mail, their packages, and the things that they need, Lord, to do, to do your work. Lord, we pray with the other missionaries that are out in the field, Lord. We thank uh, those that are coming here for our mission, missions emphasis weekends, a weekend, and those that cannot be here. Pray, Lord, to give uh, safe passage to the, the FAFs, and Lord, to... Uh, uh, comfort to those that uh, would be here in, in spirit, Lord. Lord, we pray thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen. And one of, uh, as I say, it's probably my favorite book in the scriptures. It's just amazing. Paul, way in trial and death, and writes this tremendous relationship book full of joy. <clears throat> there is a Bible prison hall of fame. People who went to prison, who were biblical characters, who were in prison for no criminal thing that they have done. We think, for example, Joseph, right? He had not done anything, falsely accused, placed in prison. Probably should have been executed, but probably Potiphar knew that he really wasn't guilty and ends up being a ruler. Uh, Jeremiah was thrown in prison. Not only was Jeremiah thrown in prison, he was thrown in a cistern, and if it filled with water, he would have drowned. If it wasn't for the king's servant, Zedekiah's servant, uh, uh, 
Eber, uh, Ebed Melech, uh, he probably would have drowned. Uh, John the Baptist was thrown in the dungeon and eventually is beheaded right after Salome dances and the king makes his foolish promise. Uh, Peter was in prison. So was James. James was beheaded. Peter was released. And so we have this uh, prison. And Paul had been in prison so many times that, you know, one evangelist, I think it's Billy Graham, said when he went to town, he didn't check the hotels. He checked the prison to see what his conditions were going to be. <laughs> and so, uh, and it's almost, there's some truth in that. So he's writing his prison letter, and, and, and he, this, he has this tremendous, tremendous testimony here at, at Philippians 1, chapter 12, and we pick it up here, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ, and most of the brethren in the Lord having become confident that my chains are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What a tremendous test. And so he's writing his letter, of course, uh, the Philippian church is concerned about Paul, he's in Rome, he's in prison, he might be executed. And uh, the story is he's going to be released for lack of evidence, then later on arrested after the far Roman 64 AD, and the, the, according to tradition is beheaded on the, uh, the Ostia way outside of Rome in 67 AD. Now no one thought that Paul's prison was a good thing, you know, no one says, okay, I'm going to prison, this is really tremendous, you know, that's that, that, that's not the attitude most people have. And so Paul's put in prison. All the, the Christians are concerned about this. And uh, Paul might be found guilty and executed for sedition because he is promoting a religion that is not sanctioned by the state. And by the way, I, where we're heading in this country, I don't know if you see it or not, that's where we're heading. Unsanctioned speech not free speech, unsanctioned speech, will be punished. Now, Paul was out of circulation as a preacher, and that was not a good thing. And, but Paul was not a state criminal. This had to do with his belief system. Now, even though, like Joseph, who said that man meant for evil, but God meant it for good, that many people might be saved alive, his enemies meant his jailing to for evil, and but God meant it for good. So instead of stopping the gospel, Paul says, it actually has advanced it. Only God could do that, right? To take your enemy and turn it around so it furthers what God wants to have done. Now, God used the situation to spread the word of God, and it's kind of interesting. So Paul said there's three benefits. There are three benefits from my imprisonment. He says, I've gained a new audience. Now, get this. Paul is a prisoner. Guards are guarding him. They have to stand there. Now, the guards are his prisoners. There's a captive audience. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> So what is Paul doing during this time? He's preaching to the guards. <laughs> He's preaching to, and when people would come, were allowed to come visit Paul, the guards would hear what's being said, and it's talking about the gospel and advancing. So he opened up a prison ministry to the guards. <laughs> okay, first prison ministry, here you go, right here in this passage. And instead of gaining a reputation as a criminal, Paul became known as a persecuted preacher of Christ. You know, they're standing there and saying, well, this guy's not a rebel, right? This guy's not a thief. This guy's not a murderer. And, and why are you here? And so Paul is able to preach the gospel to them while he's there. The third thing was, Paul says, my chains have not only not stopped the gospel, but my chains have made those other believers who are were afraid, now more bold to preach the gospel because they could see how I am able to stand up against this persecution. And not only 
by enduring it, but actually having joy in the process. And so there's nothing like the encouragement of when you're taking a look at someone who is under persecution, a mature Christian, and say, wow, look how they're handled. They're not, they're not, and it might not be persecution, it might be severe health issues, right? Or it might be some other trial. And say, wow, look at the dignity and the faith that this person's carried on. I mean, Job's a prime example, right, of the Old Testament. So Paul says it's made him even bolder to preach the gospel. Now, Paul's in prison. The guards had to be rotated. It's usually every four hours the guards were rotated. And so he had a new audience every four hours. You know, they'd come in and, you know, he begins to talk to them. So being the captive, Paul witnessed to a captive audience. And not only were they listening, some of them were coming to Christ and they were carrying the gospel back where? Right into the palace. <laughs> I mean, no one could have gone in there any other way, right? So God had a plan and said, okay, let's put you in here. You preach and we're going to actually... Send the gospel in under Nero's nose, right there in the in the palace. And so the guards were considering the words of Paul, and many came to faith. And by the way, I won't mention his names, but I wrote a book about it. Uh, you know, one of the things that the fellow prisoners came up to this young man and said, "Says you don't belong here." They can tell his testimony, his witness, and everything else. It just didn't match what was going on. And they can tell, right, if you're a hardened criminal and everything. They can tell, you don't belong here. And so that's what they were saying to Paul. They were coming up to Paul and say, uh, Paul, why are you here? Well, I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. came to save the world. That, you know, that, that Christ, let me tell you about him and everything else. Because he wasn't a thief. He wasn't a robber. He wasn't, he wasn't any of these state criminals that they're normally dealing with. And as the guards came to faith, they took the gospel back to the palace. They were telling the stewards, they were telling the, the, the chefs, they were telling the bakers, they were telling the, you know, those who were the uh, wine tasters, and they were telling the maids. And all of a sudden, not only did Nero not stop the spread of the gospel, but all of a sudden the gospel was in his very palace. And so the move to stop the gospel actually brought the gospel into Caesar's household. It reminds me of the story of Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was, of course, a tremendous hater for Jews, which is interesting because he had Jewish blood in his family. Uh, and so in the 1930s, before World War II was kicked off, he asked the company, French company Mont Blanc, to make him a pen, a special pen. And so they did, and supposedly everybody assumes that that little, uh, you know, little white cap on top of his Mont Blanc, the snow one and stuff. Like, well, it's not. It's a Jewish star. And so throughout the entire war, he's carrying a Jewish star in, in his vest pocket because Mont Blanc was a Jewish-owned company. And so uh, the same thing you have here. You have Nero trying to stop the gospel, when the gospel is being put right into his palace because Paul was in the, uh, you know, in the prison preaching to the guards. Now, Paul was not deterred by the jail or the threats. Paul was able to speak to an audience that was unreachable by any other means. And by the way, this is one of the things that God sometimes do, does. Is, in fact, you can't reach this audience here, but God finds a way to make you do it. Right? I mean, the God, he, he has a work around the devil, doesn't he? You say, well, how did, how did the gospel get there? Well, that's how God planned it. And so, so here Paul's in prison. He's reaching people that no, long, no one else because you could not just walk into the palace and start preaching the gospel. Now, Paul, now this is, this is, this is the most important thing in, in, in this passage, I think. Paul did not see his persecution as a trial, but as an opportunity. And it's one of the things uh, this last lesson is teaching the cadets is about perception, that every trial is an opportunity. There's something there to advance. It's another way of doing things. It's another way of advancing. And Paul did not see this as something to be uh, mourned over and something to feel like he's a victim. But okay, 
what does God want me to do here? And the famous uh, Puritan preacher Richard Baxter made that statement. And they asked him, what, wonder if you're in prison. And he says, I'll just move my pulpit to the prison. I mean, he didn't see it as a negative. He saw it as a positive, right? It's something he could do, something he could advance. And so Paul saw this as an opportunity. And God uses the suffering of believers as a testimony and the faithful sufferer bears fruit. And one of the greatest promises that the believer has, we have to really grab a hold of it, take it seriously, does all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And we need to come to the point and say, yes, all things do work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. And so if we take that, that this disaster that's come on, on us is an opportunity. And we're waiting to see this disaster that came upon us this last week. Someone stole one of the checks in the mail and, and erased it and, and put in $10,000 to their own name. And it actually went through the whole system. They took the picture of it on the phone and said, so $10,000 out of our account. So we're working through that and everything. But there's some opportunity here. There's something. It is all the trouble and the difficulties and everything else. So we're waiting to see what God's going to do through this type of uh, intervention. And so uh, that's what Paul saw. There's some kind of opportunity here. And so, and we don't know, listen, we don't know what God's going to do, right? And the trial till we go through it. And sometimes you want to know to, you know, till eternity, right? You get in eternity and say, this is what's happening. I mean, that's, I'm sure that's what happened to Job. He was never told what was happening. We got an attorney and say, oh, by the way, there's this thing with Satan and all this stuff. And, and that's why I think I take comfort in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 12. He says, one day, I, we see through a glass dark, but one day I will know as what? As I'm known. One day I'll know all this. Oh, man, that's how that was working. But we don't have to know how it's working. God knows. And we take comfort that God knows what he's doing, that he's working through all this process, even COVID-19. <laughs> he's working through, he's doing something we need to understand that he's in control of the whole thing. And so we must trust that he is leading us. Now, persecution has three main purposes. One, Paul says it proves your faith. You know, without trials, right, your faith is not tested. And so he's telling the Philippians, he said, listen, the persecution proves your faith. It shows, it's, is it genuine? Is it you know, if you crumble underneath the persecution, then maybe it's not genuine, or maybe it's just weak, whatever. But is, is your faith genuine? It proves you, it tests you. And there's two ways you can go with this. There really is. One is we can cry about, oh, I'm a victim, I don't deserve this, why is this going on? Or we say, okay, God, what are you, what are you going to do through this? And we're going to look and say, hey, God is having me under this, because I didn't cause this. God caused it so it allowed it to happen. So God must be going to use it somehow. And not that we are always thrilled about persecution, right? I'm sure Job would have preferred that conversation in heaven between God and Satan did not happen. But he's glad it did later on because he was highly rewarded. And so here it proves our faith. It tests our faith. Secondly, it's working in others in new ways. They're watching us. Believe it or not, there's a lot more people watching you. Well, we know that now. I don't understand the whole thing, but I'll mention something to my wife about something that, you know, you're either going to buy or just bought or something like that, and I come to the office next day and ads for that start popping up. I say, what? It's happened three or four times. I said, somebody says, I don't even have uh, Alexa. You know, I don't even know Siri. I mean, and so, uh, but, but there are more people watching your testimony, right? There are people watching. They know. You claim to be a Christian. They're watching. And so others are impacted in, in, in new and different ways. Thirdly, the growth of faith and expansion of your testimony. Other people are watching and say, wow, I can see how God's working in this person's life. And then emboldens them to expand the testament. So instead of the gospel being shut down, it, it was expanding. Matter of fact, there was a saying, and I think it was Arrhenius said it, he says, 
that the seed of the church is sown in the blood of the martyrs. <laughs> and the more they killed Christians, the more Christianity spread. Because they saw there was something really worth dying for and really worth believing in. And so we have these purposes in the persecution. Now both the guards and those who met Paul, who was allowed to come visit Paul, understood the plight. The guards would stand there and say, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, this guy's not a thief murder this guy's not an extortioner he's not a rebel and so they were curious about why are you in here and remember I, you must remember this I doubt if any of those guards ever heard of Jesus Christ you know this wasn't you know we have it spread all over the place but but not back then and said, well, who are you talking about and then he tells them the story about you know, this Christ who did the miracles and about the resurrection and about the ascension and, and about his testimony, how he came to know the Lord. And remember, this is not Acts 22. Because when, in Acts 22, he's talking to a Jewish audience. <coughs> they, have no, they have no relationship with Abraham, right? They have no relationship with Moses. They, have no, they don't know any of that. This is brand new and fresh. And he says it's not only to the Jews, but it's to you too. They died for all the faith, and he can share with that. He can share about Acts 15, about the Jerusalem Council with, you don't have to become Jewish, right? You can come just as you are. And so, so he explained all that, and he had plenty of time, because these guys are working four-hour shifts. And uh, by the way, I think it was even greater for him, because one of the, one of the uh, most boring thing is being a guard, right? I mean, just you stand there, you're watching everything else. And and, uh, and so this was kind of interesting. This is brand new. So Paul had a very uh, a focused audience, and some of them were coming to faith. Secondly, Paul was, it became a testament. Paul was in prison because of Jesus Christ. And that's, that was an important statement. Because Paul was in prison for Christ. And so the next question is, who is this Christ? Why are you willing to put your life on the line for this Jesus Christ? And that added to his testimony. It became known. And so what he means by it became known is the guards started going back and talking to other guards. You know why this guy's in here? This guy's got a rebellion or an insurrectionist. This guy is in here because of Jesus Christ. Remember, where is he in prison? Rome. It's Romans 13 that he writes that we're to submit to the government. So he's not a resurrectionist, right? <coughs> he is in there because of his testimony. Number three, Paul's demeanor and deportment testify that he was an honorable man suffering of genuine faith. I mean, this guy, this guy was not... A liar. He wasn't somebody deceiving. He was an honest guy. They can tell by talking to him. This guy was a forthright guy, an honest guy. He wasn't somebody who was a hardened criminal. And so that added to his testimony. Now, when, when everybody was looking at this, we had what I call a chain reaction. Paul, before Paul's imprisonment, many believers were fearful to witness were afraid. We have that today, don't we? We have many people afraid to talk about Christ. It's, the atmosphere is getting worse and worse. And, and uh, of course, many uh, many people around the world, you know, martyred. And, and uh, you, know, you know, just if you just read the church around the world, that we're talking about, uh, you know, a thousand Christians in Nigeria, northeast Nigeria, killed by these uh, these uh, is. Islamist radicals, and they tell them you either get off your land or, or, or you take your life. And nobody in Nigerian government do anything about it. These, these Flamini uh, uh, farmers are killing Christians and, and taking their land. We see that all around the world. And so here there were people afraid in Paul's day to preach to Christ and not one to suffer the wrath of the government. And Paul demonstrates no. You're to stand up for Christ even in the face of the persecution and not be discouraged and, and, and not come to the point where you're, you're going to uh, uh, give in or, or give up or hide somewhere. Uh, 
and emboldened the witness, and so more people began witnessing. Matter of fact, the next the next passage we're going to look at next week is kind of interesting. It says some of them started preaching so they might add to Paul's chains. In other words, they're preaching and say, oh boy, we really got to get rid of this Paul. He's causing all this problem. He said, it doesn't matter to me, just so the gospel was preached. And so here we come to the believers, you know, are emboldened. And when we bravely, listen, this is, this is so critical. When we're bravely determined that we're willing to suffer with joy for Jesus Christ, nothing can stop. If they take away the one threat they have, right, Jesus talked about that, right? Don't fear the one that can destroy the body, but fear the one that can destroy both body and soul and hell. If they take away that threat, what else do they have? I mean, uh, Robert Zacharias asked the question, you know, after Lazarus was resurrected from the dead, what else would you threaten them with? I'm going to kill you. Hey, been there. I know who's going to let me out. <laughs> you know? I mean, what else would you threaten with him after he's raised from the dead? You know, and matter of fact, that's what his gravestone in Jerusalem says. Lazarus twice dead. That's what it says. Lazarus twice dead. You know? And, and, and so, after he's raised, what are going to threaten him with? Right? And so, so here, Paul says, if we are willing and able to stand in joy, and in, and, and in faithfulness and in perseverance against whatever comes our way, we don't have to fear anything else. Because we know he's going to carry us through. So once the fear of suffering and death are removed from us, a believer can reach his full influence for Jesus. You know, when we're timid in our faith, right? When we're timid in and, and what we do, we can't be fully effective for Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean we go out looking for trouble. <laughs> or it doesn't mean that we violate laws which, uh, which you know, really has nothing to do with, you know, our faith. Remember, there's a difference between our faith and constitutional issues. Those are two different issues. We're to be good citizens. But to stand up against the testimony and say, you are to be quiet, said, no, we're not going to do that. And uh, that, that you're not you're to uh, avoid getting together and assembly. No, we're not going to do that. And so this is one of the things, for example, Grace out at out in the you know MacArthur's church out in L.A. They're, they're they're fighting this battle. You know, can the government shut you down from meeting, even if it's in some kind of pandemic? And so they're going through the legal processes now. Uh, and so once that's removed. You know, we're good. Now, I want to tell you something. We're going to, this, is, this, is, this is critical because of our sin nature. There's three major enemies to your testimony. There really are. Uh, one is laziness. It really is. I mean, what does it say in Ecclesiastes 12? To study is what? Weariness of the flesh. It, it's hard. We like things fed to us. We like things. Matter of fact, let me tell you a testimony. It's from last night. One of the guys working the um, the computers for the readathon. His grandfather is the one that wrote that track of salvation and in Christ. I forget the exact name. We we used it for years. The little red track. Yeah, the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation. Yeah, that little red track and had all the words and everything. We don't use it anymore because people want to see what. Yeah, they want to see pictures. You want to see images, you want to fish it. This just told you the plan of salvation. His grandfather wrote that track. Millions of them were passed. That's the only track we used to pass out. We had a picture of the church on the front and, and the, the plan of salvation. That's what it's called. And we still have some, I think, back in there. His grandfather wrote that. <laughs> I said, what a neat thing. But we've changed, haven't we? People are lazy. They want things in bullet points. They want things uh, fed to them. They want things processed. Well, Lazy Christians are going to lead to ineffective Christians. Really, not me. We have to be in the Word of God, which is more important than the television show, which is more important than what you do on the website, which is more important than what you, uh, you know, what uh, games you're watching. It's more important than any other thing. It's the fact the Word of God's primary, and it's, and it can't be spoon-fed. You know, listening to people teaching and preaching are things good. 
Well, it doesn't get the Word of God inside you, right? Isn't that what I want us about? Getting the Word of God inside you. So laziness is, is, is the number one. And number two is fear. Well, if I do this, what's going to happen? Well, that's in the hands of the Lord, right? And, uh, you know, we need a boldness. We don't need to be brazen. We need to be wise, right? But we need to be courageous. We need to be on a... We, we, we don't need to be embarrassed that we belong to Jesus Christ and that, that, that we have a testimony for Jesus Christ. And so, so we need to remove that fear out of our lives. There, there are Christians. I remember years ago, I was at an IFCA conference and had some Ukrainian, uh, you know, Ukrainian uh, pastors visiting. And they gave up and they preached a message that says, you American Christians need a good dose of persecution. Well, I didn't hear any amens uh, yeah, in the audience, but what he was saying is the fact, you, you, I don't see the boldness, you know, and everything else. You just have it too soft. And that brings us to the third point. You've got laziness, fearfulness, pleasure. Pleasure. And uh, given the choice between destruction by persecution and destruction by pleasure, pleasure would be the most dangerous ever. Because Satan would rather distract you and get you involved in things to entertain yourself rather than destroy you. Why? Because people look at you and say, oh, well, if that's what the Christian about. I'm one, I'm, I'm one too, right? Involved in entertainment, involved in, you know, what is the, the next, uh, you know, the next thing coming down, down the pike. And, and we're supporting things during evil. You, you realize I was going to get into this, but we've got plenty of time. Uh, the Netflix film that's just come out, Cone of Age, you know about that? Taking 11 to 14 year old girls and sexualizing them? That people get arrested for child pornography, that, and they're putting it out on the screen as a, as a company, as a movie, as an art form? And there are over 700 girls that auditioned, brought there by their parents for this? That's where we're heading. And when we're involved in these companies doing that's what we're supporting. You know, death by pleasure is a death that is certain and sure, and it's those things that are more certain to bring Christians down than what persecution. And so these three things we've got to really be guard against and fight against the laziness, the fearfulness, and the seeking of pleasure. And so Paul showed how to be confident in sharing the faith and how to make Christ the single focus and how to make him the, the number one purpose of your life because of the eternal purpose and trust. And by the way, it's the only eternal purpose. It's not going to ask us what the score was in a game. <laughs> it's not going to ask us about uh, you know, our favorite television show. It says, what have you done for me? Instead of seeking in why I'm suffering, the believer needs to seek what is God's purpose in it. Two different questions. You know, what, our first thing when something happens to you, say, why, Lord, right? Why do I have this disease? Or why, why is this, this happening to me in my life? Or why this circumstance? Paul says, don't ask why. Ask, okay, Lord, what do you, what do you, what's your purpose in this, right? What, what do you have for me in this? And so this is exactly what we need to come to a point of understanding. Faithfulness through trials will always bear fruit in due season. You might not see it right away. If you're faithful through the trials, you will bear fruit. It's the way it is. You know, uh, one of the most famous episodes in modern Christian mission, of course, is the death of the five during the Aka Indian. By the way, they didn't call themselves the Aka. You know what Aka means? It's a Quechua Indian term for savage. <laughs> so that's, that's what it means. You know, they, they were the Hollandes, Hollandes uh, tribe is what they called themselves. And they were in this 600-square-mile uh, area in Ecuador. And against their mission, but several, the three mission boards involved against, the mission boards didn't know Jim Elliott, uh, Ed McCauley, uh, Roger Yadarian, 
an eighth saint, uh, and who was the fifth one? Anyway, didn't know they were going in there. Uh, they went in there to try to get in, and of course they were killed. Man, this evil is bad. It really was. But they said for every death of those five men, there were over 100 mission, people volunteered for the mission field after that story hit life. So it's an evil thing, right? But it brought out a lot of people having an interest in missions that these men were willing to sacrifice their lives. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Before Christ, that I'm willing to do that too. And of course, that was made famous by Elizabeth Elliot's book, you know, At the Edge of the Spear. You know, and so, so this, this, this is something... Remember things that happen to us that are evil, God will turn it for good. And things that put pressure on you will expand your influence in ministry. And uh, one thing we need to do is look for the Lord in it. That we see what the Lord's going to bring out. Amen? Let's pray. The gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here this morning. We just pray, Lord, that as we come to a conclusion here, that we will be looking for what you're doing through areas of persecution, what you're doing in our lives as far as these challenges, doing in this lives as far as the, the concepts that you have uh, uh, before us, Lord, and, and just look for opportunities to minister. Lord, uh, we admit that we're weak. Help us to be strong. We admit that we have a uh, focus that is divided. Lord, help us to understand what is important to focus upon. And Lord, protect us from our own propensity constantly seek pleasure, Lord, that we might be able to stand with proclamation rather than seeking the pleasure. Lord, bless your people, draw them ever closer to you, and may you work in and through them for your glory. And may we be found faithful till we see you face to face. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.